Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby we bring you Cram Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So what I thought I should uh, talk about today is uh, uh, expand on the acquiring evidence part of evidence-based practice. So we talked about acquiring evidence last time uh, and I thought I should uh, run through an example um, of something I would uh, look for evidence as part of my practice and, and uh, use that to highlight uh, what you can do in your own sort of uh, practice or uh, as you interact with patients. So acquiring evidence is um, the second step in the practice of ABM. As you um, already know, the five steps are listed on the screen here. Ask, acquire, appraise or interpret, apply and evaluate or assess. Yeah, so you could you could think of it as a five A's: ask, acquire, appraise, apply, and assess. So we're talking about acquiring the evidence. Last time we talked about types of clinical questions. If you remember, uh, I mentioned foreground questions and background questions. I'll mention them again. We talked about some search techniques like concept building, and uh, we talked about keywords, mesh headings, Boolean operators, and searching in phrases within quotes, searching um, with parentheses or brackets, nesting and field tags. So I'm gonna start off with a clinical scenario and I'll just uh, highlight or explain how I uh, uh, tried to formulate some questions and then went to search literature and answer and try and find answers for my own sort of understanding and hopefully also for the patient's benefit. So there's a lady in her 60s who was incidentally detected to have raised CA99 during workup of her GI symptoms. Now, it wasn't very clear why the CA99 was done in the first place, and that is a, an important sort of lesson for, for, uh, for us as practicing clinicians. You don't want to do tests um, which are not directly relevant to the patient's problems. If not, you're on the risk of incidentally picking up um, picking up abnormalities, which may not have clinical relevance, but we may, which may lead to unnecessary testing and intervention. So anyway, she had raised CA99, um, and she's known to have IPMN, which is introductal papillary mucinous neoplasm of the pancreas. It's a condition in the pancreas that is often picked up on imaging. Um, it is pre-malignant for certain types of IPMN, resection is considered uh, necessary, important. For certain other types, they're simply observed. So that's something to, to keep in the back of your mind. It will be relevant uh, later on as I discuss the case. And then she's also known to have a mesenteric cyst. Both of these conditions were being managed conservatively. Um, there wasn't an obvious cause for the raised CEA. And the patient was a little bit worried that she had this tumor marker that was high and then and, um, and people couldn't explain the reason for the tumor marker being high. And one of the clinicians looking after her did a PET scan, um, which is partly to address um, the issue of the race CA99 to see if there's anything else and the problem, underlying problem. And the PET scan picked up a thyroid nodule and that's how she came to see me. So, um, we dealt with the thyroid nodule, but that's not the topic of discussion here. But I had a few queries about uh, this, this patient. So I've just listed a few examples, but you could have, you could have your own uh, clinical questions. You could have many other questions arising from an encounter such as this. So I was thinking, uh, right, I really need to refresh my knowledge about CA99 and uh, refresh my, uh, my, my knowledge about what conditions are linked with the race CA99. And then I was thinking, as the patient is worried, I was wondering, what is the likelihood of a false positive uh, high CA99? 
or the likelihood of having a high CA99 without cancer. Now, if it's a benign condition and the CA99 is raised, and that's okay, you know, we, for most of these benign lesions such as mesenteric cysts, we wouldn't intervene unless there was a complication. Um, and I then was wondering about what's the likelihood of having a raised CA99 in an otherwise sort of benign looking IPMN and a mesenteric cyst. And if that likelihood was high, then, then I am reassured that I can reassure the patient. And the final question I had in the clinic was, now that we know the CA99 is raised and we haven't found anything significant, or at least not yet, um, is there any value in carrying on measuring it to see whether it's going to go higher and higher, or do we just not um, uh, measure, it, measure it at all? So uh, these are just some examples, some questions uh, that um, uh, we were thinking about in the clinic. Now, the first thing you might want to do if as a medical student or a junior surgical trainee is to uh, gain some background uh, knowledge about CA99. So you could do that. Traditionally, we used to do that when I was a medical student by, by going through the textbooks and um, hard copies in the library. And these days, you can look up online textbooks. And there are numerous online textbooks that are, some of them are free, some of them you have to pay that you can access. Another source which can be quite useful is what is referred to as point of care information summaries. So, um, or evidence-based reviews they're called. And you may have come across some of these um, information summaries if you subscribe to UpToDate. And there's, a, there's another one called Dynamed. There's the BMJ Best um, Evidence. And there are quite a few of these these days, which will provide you fairly up-to-date uh, summaries of information about a specific disease, about a specific drug, about a syndrome, and, uh, or an operation even, and then they can be quite useful. And these kinds of summaries are usually peer reviewed, so which is good. And uh, uh, they, some of them are freely available, but uh, a lot of them need a, a subscription, so they may not be easy to access. Another source, um, in addition to point of care information summaries, uh, would be review articles. And this is what I would go to uh, if I had a question, for example, about CA99. I'll come to that in a minute. And I'd go and find a recent review in a good quality journal. Now, you may ask, what is a good quality journal? And trying to identify good quality journals comes partly by, uh, by um, reading around a fair bit and doing this uh, repeatedly and gaining experience and knowing um, how to identify you know, good quality journals and so on. So you search for an appropriate review article, and we discussed before how we um, search for specific articles on specific topics, how we use concepts and we put the concepts together and so on. Uh, and, and the more you do this, the more regularly you go and search uh, databases to look for good review articles, the better you get at in finding a good article and then obviously reading it. Some review articles, unfortunately, might be behind a paywall and you might have to uh, you know, uh, ask your librarian to get it. Very, very few, very rarely do we really uh, pay for articles. We try and find uh, ways of getting around the payment, usually by asking um, our librarian, or we simply look for articles that are free to access. Right, so coming back to our question, uh, this lady had a raised CA99 and we, we were wanting to know more about this. So I typed in CA99 and review in PubMed and I stumbled upon this article. And this was in the World Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery and uh, uh, it talked about CA99 as a, as a tumor marker in a very broad way. And uh, um, it seemed a reasonably good uh, read. So one of the first things um, you could do, uh, and I do tend to do this, is to look at the journal, look at the institution. And um, this is really very important when you're looking at primary research, where the paper is about um, patient level data. Um, it's not that important for uh, reviews. Um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, 
So the, the actual institution of the journal may not be that important as long as the reviews of uh, decent quality, but that's something to think about. Now, I read this paper, I got lots of useful, useful information about CA199 that enhanced my background knowledge, made me more confident um, in talking about CA199. I'm not gonna talk about that now. Um, and it also gave me some more leads for uh, doing further searches in relation to helping this particular patient. And it helped me refine my foreground question. So having read um, about CA99 in this review, um, I found a few important uh, bits of information. So CA99 is raised in several benign and malignant diseases. I didn't know that before, I must say, but uh, I didn't know that CA99 was associated with malignancy in IPMN. So that was a new thing for me. And I did not know that CA99 is has been associated with medullary thyroid cancer, uh, I've got to say. Now, then, like I said before, the more you read, the more you'll be able to get further leads for further searches and also refine your foreground question. So then I started worrying about whether CA99 is a good predictor of malignancy in IPMN. And given that this lady is known to have IPMN, which is intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm of the pancreas, it's like a cystic lesion in the pancreas. And because the CA99 is raised, uh, uh, have I got to worry about that? The other thing, obviously, is um, does this patient have medullary thyroid cancer? That's uh, So th those are two further foreground questions that I thought I should be looking into. So I'm just going to concentrate on the first question for the next two slides. So um, if you have a foreground question like the one I mentioned, the best thing to do would be to look up um, published articles, in, and you could look them up and search for them in one of several bibliographic databases. So here are a few examples, PubMed, Embase, Sinal, and I've got to say, um, I just stick with one database and I stick with PubMed, and I'd encourage you to just get used to one database. You rarely ever have to look at multiple databases to find answers for specific clinical questions. You'd only do that if you're gonna do a systematic review, then you might do two or three databases to ensure that you've captured all relevant articles um, aimed to uh, answer a specific research question. So um, when you search these databases, the most important thing to keep in mind is to start off with a clear, very clear foreground question, because a clear question helps you, helps you to come up with some concepts. And you can use these concepts in what we call concept building to formulate your search strategy. Okay, so, um, so our question was, is CA99 a good predictor of malignancy in IPMN? So I typed in CA99 as a keyword, IPMN is another keyword, combined them with AND, and I got 90 results on PubMed. This was a very recent search. Keep in mind that uh, the, the concepts CA99 and IPMN might have alternative keywords. So CA99 might be referred to as carbohydrate antigen 99 or Sala Lewis antigen A and so on. Similarly, IPMN might go by many different words. So, you could, uh, so you've got to keep those in mind and maybe use those alternative keywords or use um, what we refer to as control vocabulary or mesh headings. And this is something we touched upon last time. So, uh, so, that, so we've, we've talked about that before. Um, 90 results was too much for me. Um, you, you know, we're, we're busy people. We've got lots of things to do. So I thought if I needed one or two articles, I'd really love to have, um, read a systematic review, which is at the top of the evidence hierarchy. It'll probably include uh, all relevant literature on the topic. So I filtered the search uh, by clicking on systematic review. And lo and behold, I landed... Uh, on a fairly good systematic review, looking at a number of uh, predictors of malignancy in IPMN, right? And this lady has IPMN and her CA99 is raised. So I looked at this review and the review uh, had two really important conclusions. One was raised serum CA99 
was the most specific feature uh, that predicted malignancy in IPMNs and um, raised uh, CA99 yielded sensitivity of 0.38 and specificity of 0.90 in the diagnosis of malignancy in IPMN. So this is important for me because this, this lady had a high CA99 and an IPMN, right? So it's really relevant for this lady. So and that's a very important observation. Now, if you have a test that has got not so high sensitivity, but a very high specificity, and you've got a, um, a positive test, that's quite significant. But we, we shouldn't jump to conclusions. We should just think a little bit about what this means and also consider what the population or setting um, was in, in which the various articles in the systematic review were conducted. We should think about what does raised mean? What's the threshold here? And then is that uh, the threshold that you have in your laboratory assay? Are we talking about similar assays? Uh, are we talking about serum and not cyst fluid and things like that? And um, is there a huge um, dose response effect? In other words, uh, is there going to be a big difference between what might be considered marginal elevation or something that is fivefold or tenfold the upper limit of the normal range? So there are all these things to think about, yeah? And also, if I'm looking at a predictive uh, marker, a biomarker, or a diagnostic test, I'd like to really see predictive values as opposed to sensitivity and specificity. Predictive values are clinically much more important. Now, I don't want to go into the details of, of uh, this particular sort of concept uh, that we've covered before, and it's kind of out of scope here, but, but, but there are a number of things to think about before we jump to uh, conclusions and, and ring alarm bells. However, a very high specificity or a very high sensitivity uh, can be quite important. For example, if you have a really high specificity, they might help to rule in disease if you have a positive test. So there's a mnemonic called SPIN you might have heard of. SP stands for specificity, P stands for positive test, and IN stands for ruling in disease. So if you have a high specificity and the test is positive, then the, then the diagnosis is virtually confirmed. And here it might mean malignancy in IPMN. Similarly, you may have heard of this mnemonic called SNOUT, S-N-N-O-U-T, sensitivity, high sensitivity, negative test, you can rule out the disease. Okay, so these are just little things to keep in the back of your mind if you come across tests with high specificity or high sensitivity. But like I said, remember, ideally, you would like to have predictive values, positive and negative predictive values. And then those are the ones that are really useful clinically. So how does this help me and my patient? What do I need to do? Now, uh, you've got to keep in mind that uh, you may not be. I certainly am not a pancreatic surgeon. And I've just come across this patient in my practice, in my clinic. So um, this is enough for me to ask for help. Call the um, experts, the hepatobiliary experts, or send them to the liver and the pancreas MDT. Um, mention this finding and make sure that this is reviewed. Make sure that this is taken into consideration along with all the other radiological features and clinical features, and they can make the minds up as to whether this IPMN can continue to be monitored and managed conservatively or whether they need to think about resecting this. Okay. Now, I've not talked about uh, the other uh, finding uh, in my searches, which is that ray CA99 can be a marker for medullary thyroid cancer as well. Um, but again, that's a lead that I'd need to follow. And this is how a, a quick and easy literature search um, can help you address uh, not just your curiosity about um, specific clinical conditions or biomarkers, but also help the patient. Because at the end of the day, that's the that's primary aim, isn't it? Okay. So just to summarize what I've said, uh, be inquisitive. Uh, th things might not necessarily be in your direct field of interest, but um, if it matters to the patient, then you've got to probe things a bit further to see if we have dotted the I's and crossed the T's, if you like, uh, in the management of the patient as a whole. 
So in searching databases and getting to the articles you need, initially you might be quite frustrated, might take you a long time, but with practice, you will find that you get to the information you need, yeah? And you'll be able to zone in on uh, information that is relevant to you and your patient much quicker and much more efficiently. Now, um, I hope um, with this example, I've highlighted that there might be lots of protocols on how to manage RACE-C, ACA-199, or how to manage IPMN. There might be guidelines or textbooks. And I call this tertiary sources, tertiary sources of evidence, yeah? But they don't necessarily help address many of our day-to-day -day problems. We've got to um, be uh, efficient and we've got to practice looking at primary and secondary sources. By primary sources, I mean original research or patient level data. By secondary sources, I mean systematic reviews and meta analysis. Like the paper we just discussed, that's a secondary source of evidence. What you read in a textbook or guideline or maybe something like up to date, I would uh, call that tertiary sources of evidence. So, tertiary sources of evidence to me help you uh, in your background needs to build up your background knowledge. But primary and secondary sources often are invaluable in answering the foreground questions that you might have. Okay, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.